Thank you, Sue. What an honor it is to have the CEO of the Gates Foundation um, kick off this event, and it's an equally, if not greater honor, to have you all here to share in this night with us. Um, we have a packed program for the next 60 minutes, and um, we're really, really excited. So I should introduce myself briefly. I'm trained as an architect. Um, I've done some work with Aspen Global Health and Development, uh, both in my role as an architect, but also in my work as a storyteller. Uh, I work principally for TED. And um, if you haven't already, I highly recommend Sue's newly posted TED Talk that she gave in Vancouver this past, this past February on precision public health. And it's really talking about how to aggregate uh, big data and um, uh, consumer experiences and a whole range of other innovative tools. And it's a wonderful talk about a subject uh, obviously near and dear to the Gates Foundation and directly related to our work here tonight. Anna. Thank you, John. So I'm Anna Umbima, and I describe myself as a recovered journalist. I worked for a very long time for the BBC um, as a producer, as a presenter, foreign correspondent, but now I'm doing exactly what I love, which is working with other people, particularly in Africa, and helping them with their communication skills. So I'm based in London, but I travel all over. And so we're also very lucky to have Anna here. She has established some really meaningful and deep relationships with the fellows, having um, worked with them in Joburg, as she explained, and coached them over the past several days uh, along with the Moth crew. And, um, and I'm just so happy to have Anna joining as a co-host for the first time. So big round of applause for Anna. How about that? Thank you. So with, with, with polio, um, you know, on the horizon as something that we very well may be able to eradicate, um, we started thinking to ourselves, well, what other finishing lines are there? What other things could we reasonably expect to solve or resolve in the next several decades? I mean, the truth of the matter is that finishing lines are something that all of us in our own lives, but especially these amazing uh, folks working in global health and development, address almost every single day. Uh, but there are some bigger finishing lines that, that are near and dear to a lot of us, that a lot of us spend our careers and our lives uh, working toward. And so we're going to hear some stories about what those are. Yes, I think sometimes working in global health and development feels like you're taking two big strides forward, and then there's three going backwards. Um, and we're not going to reach those finishing lines unless we hear from the people working on the ground, people that we're going to hear from this evening, the people who, you know, every day go out there and make sure that things happen. And they've got some great stories to tell about, and personal stories to tell about their challenges, their successes, and some of the strange things that happen along the way. So this is not an accident that these extraordinary people came together. It was with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that Aspen New Voices Fellowship was launched in 2013. Um, there are over 60 fellows at this point um, that, have, that have come through the program during the past four years, 22 of which happen to be with us here currently in Aspen. So an amazing showing here. Um, they represent 23 countries, including all parts of Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. And there, as, as um, Sue noted, there is a huge number of women among them, and um, they're really extraordinary. And nominations for the 2017 class uh, will open in September, and you can go to aspennewvoices.org in order to nominate someone. And there's many of us in this room that I'm sure work with partners in other countries. Um, we really rely on you to advance nominations, and um, we, we appreciate your help in advance. And so um, one other thing I guess I've neglected to mention is that a big piece of this, as, as Sue and as Anna have explained, is about storytelling. And so we help the fellows kind of craft their and refine their personal narrative. And that manifests in op-eds in the New York Times, in main stage TED Talks, in NPR interviews, and in a whole array of local media. Over 1,000 media appearances by this extraordinary group of people over the past four years. That's pretty awesome. And just to give you a brief idea of what they go through, so the fellowship is one year, and they get some very intense training in opera ed writing, 
in radio and television presenting and uh, interviewing and all those kinds of things, social media, and as we heard, they take workshops with the moth storytellers. And then when they're not all together, uh, they get support from people like me. Sorry, I'm popping. I've got lots of peas. Uh, <laughs> they get support from people like me. I'm a mentor, and we're in constant contact, and they get lots of support with their work. But I think, like most, most fellowships, the most important thing is what they get from each other. I think coming together, don't you think, guys? Coming together and sharing their ideas and their experiences means they're not alone. They can really, across the globe, really share what's going on and come up with new solutions for what's going on. So um, please do nominate people if you know some great people that could come through next year. And with that, we get to approach the part of the night where we kind of turn the title on its head. This whole thing is called Undaunted because these people truly are in their work. But getting up and sharing your story for a few minutes even in front of an amazing group of people like this can be daunting, in fact. And so it's for that reason that we started with somebody who claims that she never gets nervous speaking. <laughs> Normally that's a red flag for me when, in my work with Ted, uh, but then she spoke and I'm like, no wonder. So, um, Crystal Weddy is a doctor, <laughs> is a doctor working to improve health care for women and children in her native Democratic Republic of Congo, and she's based in her adopted home of Pretoria, South Africa. Um, I already blew the punchline that she never gets nervous, but I want to go ahead right now and crown her best dressed of the night. <laughs> Welcome to the stage, Crystal Weddy. The Democratic Republic of Congo my beautiful country, with its flowing blue rivers in the north, acres of green, lush rainforest in the east, tropical fruit trees lining the streets, and all forms of mineral wealth that you can imagine. In the late 1980s, my sister and I would play in the streets of Lubumbashi for hours, completely unaware that my beautiful country was in a state of ruin that my father, a pediatrician, was unable to make ends meet despite spending hours in the hospital ward, and that we as a country were on the brink of civil war. As the political and socioeconomic conditions in my country deteriorated, my father took the difficult decision to move us to South Africa to give us a chance at a better life. Despite leaving Congo at a very young age, I missed it terribly, longed to return, longed to remain connected to other young Congolese women like myself. As a teenager and young medical student, I spent hours watching YouTube videos on life in my beloved country. And that's when I realized the reality of a woman, of being a woman in the Congo. A reality that could have been my story if my father had not been educated. Tens of thousands of young Congolese women, like myself, were dying every day. Not because of the raging war in the East, with its mass rapes and epidemic levels of sexual violence, or because of the annual outbreaks of tropical infectious diseases, including Ebola. No, thousands upon thousands of Congolese women were dying because of preventable and treatable conditions during pregnancy. In healthcare facilities in Congo, one woman dies every 25 minutes during pregnancy or childbirth. This is even worse in rural communities where pregnant women walk for six to eight hours just to get to the nearest healthcare facility where they find no equipment, no medication, and an understandably frustrated and unmotivated healthcare worker. Many women choose to deliver their babies in the village under the care of a birthing mother because they're too afraid to attempt the six to eight hour walk to the nearest clinic in case they end up like their neighbor or so-and-so's wife who bled to death on the way to the clinic. As the years went by, my sadness and horror turned to anger and frustration. As a medical doctor and doctoral student in obstetrics and gynecology, I knew 
that 99% of these women were dying from preventable and treatable conditions that could be identified during the antenatal period through high quality antenatal care. I had a solution. And with the help of my good friend and public health expert, Dr. Kopano Mabaso, we developed the Onam Toto Wako project and submitted it to the Aspen Ideas Award last year. This initiative, which, which means see your baby in Kiswahili, would allow pregnant women in my community to see their babies through ultrasonography while receiving high quality antenatal care, which would screen for and treat the leading causes of maternal mortality in my region, including malaria, HIV, anemia, and high blood pressure. We won the Aspen Ideas Award last year and received a seed grant to pilot this project in Congo. As soon as the pilot began, I quickly realized that the situation on the ground was a lot worse than I'd anticipated. One woman really sticks out in my mind. She lived about 50 kilometers from the nearest hospital. Her name is Walo. Walo has already been pregnant 12 times, despite only being 30 years old. When I met Walo, she was extremely anxious about this pregnancy because three of her previous pregnancies had been stillbirths and six of her children had died before the age of five. Walo only had two children in a community where children are a sign of wealth and determines whether your husband, the breadwinner, will stay with you or replace you with a more fertile wife. We saw over 52 women that day alone on our mobile clinic, some as young as 11 years old, more than half of them had symptomatic malaria during pregnancy. However, because of our project, all these women were screened, all these women received treatment. Our pilot was a huge success. Despite the success, I went home feeling saddened, defeated, because I realized that while it is true that mothers in Congo continue to die because they do not have access to health care, there is another truth, that they continue to die because they continue to fall pregnant. And they continue to fall pregnant because the majority of their children die. This experience has helped me reevaluate our finishing line. I set out thinking that if we could, I set out thinking that if we could improve access to antenatal care, this would reduce maternal deaths in rural Congo. I now know that this cannot happen unless we ensure that the babies and children of these women survive. In short, we're back at the starting line. Both mothers and children need access to preventative and curative healthcare services. This truth will not go away. It is a daunting task. But this is my home, and these are my people. So I'm determined to throw off all disappointment and continue working, taking each challenge one day at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Christelle. So next we have a man who has chased down a cheetah, as you might have heard when he spoke on Thursday with his big idea at the opening. His name is Thumbi Mwangi, and he's a vet in Kenya, pursuing what he calls One Health for Communities and the Environment. Thumbi. So it really began at the shores of Lake Victoria in Western Kenya. I was working as a vet, following 500 little calves from the time they are born, wanting to know what infections they got in their first year of life. Then I'm called by this lady that her calf is unwell, it's sick. And I get my team and we drive off to the place in Siaya, which is, by the way, very close to where grandmother's to Obama is. <laughs> and, and when I get there, the little calf looks very sickly. It's beautiful, middle-sized, but it's drooling with saliva. I inquire from the farmer, from the lady, what happened to your calf? She says all she remembers is at some point about a, a few weeks ago, a little dog had bitten it. 
And then I look at the calf and I realize it appears like it's choking in its throat. And I remember my veterinary notes. If anything has been bitten by a dog, appears like choking, don't remove that potato up its throat. A few weeks later, I'm standing by the bedside in Kisumu District Hospital. This time, watching a little boy. Now this boy had been brought by the mother, having calmed down with fever and becoming irritated. And I inquire from the doctor, what have you been treating this boy on? Says, well, because he appears like he has irritation and mental illness, we are suspecting it's cerebral malaria. And so they have gone ahead and given the little kid, the little boy Mark, treatment for cerebral malaria. Unfortunately, he does not improve. He becomes worse and worse. He becomes more irritated. At some point, he tries biting the healthcare worker. He then runs out of the hospital towards the gate, and everyone is running after the boy and bringing them back. He's becoming more and more sick, and they have to give him antipsychotic drugs. Now, the little calf and the little boy were both suffering from the most deadly virus that we know of, rabies virus. You might not know of it. Here, you've done a perfect job. You've cleared it. You don't get children or people getting rabies. But in Africa and Asia, every 10 minutes, a child dies from rabies. It's a disease we can stop because 99% of all cases that happen in humans are actually transmitted by man's best friend, the dog. If you vaccinate the dog, you will actually completely stop the disease from getting to humans. Now the story of Mark repeats itself in the world every year 55,000 times. We can stop that. I dream as a vet in my lifetime that one day I would declare that my country Kenya has had a full year without any case of rabies. Today we experience 2,000 cases. And I dream of a day that we shall have invested enough in vaccinating dogs and in providing vaccines for children that one day the world will be free of rabies. We can do it. The science is on our side. We have the tools. We can end rabies now. Thank you so much, Thumbi. What an amazing, amazing person. Um, I've actually been thinking so much differently about wildlife in the past few days since we first met, and uh, I'm just so impressed with your work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Garba Abdu. He's a public health practitioner in Nigeria focused on eradicating polio. You might also note that he is sporting a kind of hipster hat. <laughs> he loves hats. And his, one of his favorite hats, in fact, is a cowboy hat. <laughs> but it would cast too many shadows for the cameras, so he pulled out this one tonight. Please welcome to the stage, Garba. It was 1996 when the world decided to <clears throat> help for all by the, by the year 2000. 2004 came in without anything happening. That year, effort was put together and all resources were gathered to try and eradicate polio. My role in the game was fivefold. First of all, we were to accelerate vaccines, we were to accelerate routine immunization. Routine immunization, as you know, is the foundation within which any program of uh, polio relies. Secondly, root, uh, supplemental immunization. Supplemental immunization is, a, is to go reach every child, get every child vaccinated. Thirdly, we plan the finances. Fourthly, we make sure that the resources that are supposed to go out to the nooks and corners and crevices of the, of the community go. 
Fifthly, surveillance. Surveillance is the key. Now, meanwhile, we are very busy at the national level. Everybody was involved. And then monitoring, we are monitoring from one, one country to the other, from one state to the other. So my wife called me and she said, Garba, may I talk to you? I said, what the matter? I was so much busy trying to control polio. She said, Maria is sick. I said, oh, well, I'll be there in the next two weeks. You know, no problem. I think, I thought it was a malaria, which was very common, or one of those common colds, which is all. So I continued my work, continued monitoring, continued other things that had to do with the program. So two weeks come, and, and then I got home. I got home, we got to the village, and there where I was, the girl that has always been my favorite, the girl that was, will run up to me, She's just sitting, say, hey, Maria, what's up, Maria? No, she didn't react. I went to her and picked her up. I didn't realize what was going on. I held her in my right arm, held the legs on my left arm, and, and there it was. Maria had polio. Oh my God, it was excruciating. How could I be there fighting for polio all over the country? And there, in my backyard, was polio. What am I going to do? Am I gonna, who am I going to talk to? I knew that there was no way that polio could be treated. I knew that it was irreversible damage to the little girl. It happened. And so Maria had polio. So I just didn't know what to do. I'd give, her, give the girl to my wife, run off took the car, drove along the streets, I mean, trying to get my sense right. Then I said, okay, the best way is let me come down and go to the village head. The village head is a traditional leader, and he is in control of the village. He says do and is done, or don't do and is not done. So I went to him, sat down, hello, hello, how, how, is, how, how are things with you, is it fine? Do you know that you have polio in this village? I said, no. What, are you serious? He said, yes. No, no, no. I, we have finished. You know, it's, it's done. It's over. No, no. I'm sorry. I told him that my niece, Maria, had polio. And he couldn't believe it. He thought it was a joke. So I said, now, what are we going to do? So I said, OK. Let me just give me a minute. He went and put his, uh, his traditional regalia. And then he went and collected all the, all the village heads in the village. Sit down with me and then talk to them. I said to them, this, is, this polio virus is the least virus. It, the, it, it has no harm at all. You can, you can take it. You can, you can put it in your mouth. Take it all. It will not harm you. But once you get polio, you get polio for life. And this vaccine, it's administered by anybody. Any Jig, Tom, and Harry could administer this vaccine. So when I said, OK, so I want you to go around and tell the people, tell the people that this is the situation. This is what we are going to do. We have to control it. We have to get access to it. So he agreed. They agreed. We reached an agreement. They were going to do something. I went to the traditional leader. I told him the same thing. I went to the community leader. I told him the same thing. I went to the government people. Now, the government is supposed to have the most resources to apply in the control of polio. Why aren't they, why aren't they doing that? So they said, now they don't have a plan. They don't have a program. They don't have this and that. Sit down. Let's, let's, let's work at it. We sat down, work at it, and hopefully it started. Now, polio, anybody could have a polio. And there's no reason why anybody should have a polio. So I urge you all to help me and work out an advocacy 
so that none of our children will have polio in the world. Thank you. Abdu Gaba, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And next we have another Nigerian health practitioner. Uh, she's called Folake Kio Olayenka. And uh, she's recently moved to Virginia and she works in Washington, D.C. on immunization. And I have to tell you, she's also a very mean tennis player. <laughs> she, was, um, she was a champion. No, she entered the championship for West Africa. She didn't win, she told me that. <laughs> but uh, I think she's winning now. Yes, Falake. Thank you so much. As I sat in that room in WHO um, office in Geneva, the room was full of experts from all over the world. United States, Canada, Jordan, Australia, I was the only African-based Af person in the room living in Africa, working in Africa, and uh, from Africa. And I was there contemplating what could I possibly contribute to this discussion, this discussion by a group of experts from all over the world. And as I was in that frame of mind, I thought to myself, I had no problem keeping days and nights to ensure that women and children got the medicines that they needed. I had no problem with that. I had no problem traveling on roads or no roads to get to the farthest communities and work with the health workers there to manage and, and, and serve their communities. If you needed to deliver 60 million treated bed nets for malaria prevention to the middle of nowhere, I was the girl to get it there. But here I was in this room full of experts. And the more I listened to the discussion, I realized, hey, there's a big disconnect here. So far away from reality, from the front lines, what is out there? And I, should I speak? What should I say? How should I say it? Maybe I shouldn't say anything. I would be doing wrong if I didn't say anything. I would be doing wrong to the people, to the community leaders who so desperately wanted to improve the health of their communities but didn't know how. I would be doing wrong to the health worker out there in the developing countries that are working in challenging conditions every day, often the only one providing all kinds of services. I would be doing wrong to the mother who walks hours to receive antenatal care or brings her child for immunization because she believed in the power of the vaccines to prevent diseases. I waved my name tag and I spoke. This technology is brilliant to be able to ensure that we can have potent vaccines is excellent and really needed. But you know what? There's no electricity out there. Oftentimes, there's no running water. And this is a web-based technology. There's no internet. Well, maybe in the urban centers, you probably can get some connectivity some of the time. But in the rural areas, It's a different story. At that point, I put off my microphone and I looked around. Some people were nodding. Some just stared right back at me as if I jolted them out of the sky. But that is the reality. And at that point, I knew I had something to say. I had something to contribute. 
for us to reach the global finish lines, we need to have people like me at the table, the people who are on the front line, to bridge public health practice and global strategy and policy formulation. We need to build bridges, all kinds of bridges, many bridges. I am a bridge. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a powerful, amazing, amazing person. Our next speaker actually prefers to be known as a singer. He's a karaoke champion, <laughs> often, often scoring 100%. He actually asked tonight if he could sing this whole thing. <laughs> His name is Renzo. He goes by Renzo, I should say. He goes by Renzo Guinto. He's a doctor from the Philippines. He's a new transplant to Harvard University, and he's exploring the intersection between global health and climate change. Please welcome to the stage karaoke champion Renzo Guinto. In December of 2014, I visited the town of Mariveles in my home country, the Philippines. Mariveles is known for being the starting point of the historic Bataan Death March during the Second World War. Around 80,000 Filipinos and American prisoners of war, were made to walk by the Japanese troops for nearly 70 miles. 20,000, a quarter of them, died along the way. Today, the people of Mariveles are struggling to survive yet another death march. This time, the culprit is not a foreign invader. Rather, it is a dirty industry that is polluting the air, water, and land and most especially, affecting people's health. And that is coal. During my visit, I met children unstoppably coughing as they inhaled the noxious fumes emanating from the coal plant's chimney. A mother even sobbed as she narrated to me the death of her three-month-old boy and she was attributing the death, her, her, her son's uh, leukemia, to the toxic chemicals released by the coal plant to their drinking source. Even the fishermen were complaining of declining catch, and they showed to me the coal ash floating in the seawater. And the local health facility is also not immune to the environmental pollution, its roof, and windows were all coated with coal soot. Indeed, coal is killing people's lives, and not just by driving climate change, which the Philippines, as one of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, is, is already experiencing today. But coal is killing people directly and instantly. Coal emissions have a direct effect on the lungs, heart, brain, virtually every organ in the human body. Even unborn children develop congenital anomalies due to exposure to heavy metals while still in their mother's womb. And what's worse is that communities are disproportionately affected with the poor and the marginalized suffering the greatest. When I went to Mariveles, the people were all excited because they thought that I, as a physician, could eradicate all their ills. Yes, I may be trained in treating asthma or hypertension, but I know that the medicine that I prescribe is not enough. I felt the need to step out of my clinic to target the root cause of the disease itself. And so, two years ago, I joined uh, Healthcare Without Harm, which is an international environmental health organization, to establish the Healthy Energy Initiative in the Philippines. And through the initiative, I have been engaging with policymakers from both the health sector and the energy sector, and also mobilize communities and health professionals 
to advocate for the phase out of coal, but also to demand for healthier energy choices. For sure, coal will not disappear overnight. But slowly, we are now seeing the signs of coal's decline. For instance, last April, Peabody Energy, the world's largest coal company, already filed for bankruptcy. Developing country governments like Costa Rica and Vietnam already committed to a transformed economy powered by renewable energy. And on certain days last May, both Germany and the United Kingdom met their electricity needs without burning coal. In my home country, a change in government is about to happen in a week's time. And three days before I arrived here in Aspen, our incoming president appointed one of the staunchest anti-coal activists as his Secretary of Environment. Moreover, in the Philippines, you can find not just the biggest solar farm in Asia, but also the world's largest solar-powered shopping mall. <laughs> and as a doctor, I am deeply optimistic as more and more hospitals are cutting their addiction to coal and instead putting up solar panel systems a clear demonstration of the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, not just to patients, but to the very planet that nourishes our health and well-being. Seventy years ago, the Bataan Death March ended in death. It shouldn't be the same fate for the people of Mariveles and all the other communities across the world hosting coal-fired power plants. Coal is a cheap drug we can no longer afford. And so, as a doctor, let me give you a new prescription for global health. Not in the form of a pill for temporary relief, but through preventive medicine on a planetary scale. Coal kills, and so together, let us kill coal and create a pandemic of health. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo. A very, very powerful message for us all to think about. Thank you very much indeed. So our next speaker has a very powerful online presence, which uh, demonstrates her love of art and poetry. But she also uses her online presence as an activist in the men on mental health issues. She's Satawa Wafula, and I mentor her, and I love her very much indeed. And uh, she's going to talk to you about some of the things that she does, which she make sure that people get information about this very, very important subject. Sitawa. I come from a small town equally as beautiful as Aspen called Ngong. It is located 40 kilometers from Nairobi, which is Kenya's capital. I grew up with both my parents and my three brothers, and I discovered my love for numbers at an early age. I couldn't wait to go to university to do a mathematical course. At the age of 17, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. And as a family, we were still coming to terms with this. And so at 18, when I was sexually assaulted, And so at 18, when I was sexually assaulted, I kept it to myself and I rested on the fact that I was going to actuarial school in a few months and all the calculus and statistics would help clear my mind. Growing up, I had rarely heard or read about sexual assault. In fact, the most I had heard was whispers, whispers that it might be the woman's fault. And the questions people always asked were, what time was it? What was she wearing? And what did she do to provoke the man? I can tell you from my life experience that keeping quiet is not a good idea. And calculus and statistics, they do not clear your mind. I went to university, but the unchecked trauma from the rape ordeal was given a bipolar diagnosis. 
a mental health condition that saw me drop out of university in my second year. And yet again, I found myself in that space where people spoke in whispers. And this time round, they said that what I had might have been as a result of witchcraft or a curse from God. My story is not very unique. It is a narrative most people with mental health conditions in Africa can relate to. The greater community is so afraid of mental health issues that they surround it with myths or silence. And the, and the lack of support structures or proper information have made manageable, otherwise manageable illnesses like depression or anxiety become disabling ones. If I ask us to Google mental health in Africa, you're most likely to see images of people crowded in hospitals with no beds. Or if you see any beds, you're most likely to see those people chained to those beds. Or you see images of people chained to trees in, homestead, in homesteads that are located very far from the few available hospitals. It is indeed a desperate situation. But what can we do about it? We can opt to build more hospitals and spend years training more health workers. But that means we are looking forward to a future with more people becoming mentally ill. Instead, I think we should focus on reducing those numbers. When I was raped, when I was raped, one of the things I needed most was a narrative. A narrative that I could relate to. A narrative, even if from someone who was still struggling, that would make me feel and know that there was someone somewhere who knew what I was going through. But instead of a narrative, I was met with stigma and discrimination. And so I decided to tell my story, even if just to myself. And I told my story through my poetry and on my blog. And I told my story to the local TV stations and the newspapers in my country. And today I tell my story on this stage. And the more I told my story, I realized that there was the dual diagnosis and there was the experiences that I'd gone through. But there was this beautiful, strong African girl who had so much to give the world. And so I kept, my, kept telling my story so that I could give her strength. And the more I told my story, the more people found strength to tell me their stories, even if in, in secret. And the more they told me their stories, the more I saw that yes, there's a chemical and the biological aspects of mental health, which all the wonderful initiatives we have tried to address. But then there's the social side, the side that wakes us every morning, the side that gives us hope, the side that has me on this stage, the side that saw me start My Mind, My Funk, which is an information hub that provides people in Africa with useful information so that they are able to deal with mental health conditions and also deal with everyday life. Through my work, I've been able to see people who would have otherwise been dormant become productive members of society. And this has made me see that maybe there's a finish line in mental health. And that finish line is equally reliant on us having new applications and new hospitals and training more service workers, uh, and just as importantly as looking at the social aspects of mental health, the aspects that will have us have community, connection, and conversation. Thank you.
uh, is really hard to follow. <laughs> um, hmm. I just, I can't um, reinforce, I think, probably what everyone's feeling, that uh, that is so beyond brave, you know? Just amazing. So I'm the one crying here. Uh, she's got it together. I'm uh, <laughs> a mess. Um, so with that, we have another extraordinary and brave person to welcome to the stage. Vivian... Mariweke is a food specialist, food policy specialist from Nigeria, now studying in the UK at Oxford University. Um, she is brilliant, as you'll see. She was also a beauty pageant contestant, <laughs> as you'll also see. Please welcome to the stage, Vivian. I am a mother of an 18-month-old, and I recently moved to the UK for a short while to study. As a working mother, I can walk into any restaurant or grocery shop to buy food items for my family. I can grab things from fish to meat to vegetables and even baby food, confident that my family will be fed nothing but a nutritious meal. Now, this basic activity is a different story in Nigeria where I come from. I have to buy meat early in the morning when it's fresh from the slaughterhouse, else, else I risk buying rotting meat. Also, I have to triple check the container of the baby food to be sure the food is genuine. Other times, I have to assess the face of the shop owner. If he smiles too much, maybe he's trying to woo me into buying the fake food product. I'm smarter than that. Now, I've had awful experiences with the food industry. I remember vividly on one of my road trips, I had a stopover, and I bought a can of yogurt from a reputable food company. And on opening it, I saw a dead cockroach. I also remember one of the days after work, I went to one of the local markets to buy food items to prepare dinner for my family. I felt good that I got most of the items on a bargain. And I got home, but my excitement was short-lived. I opened my shopping basket, and the rotten smell from the meat, as well as the other food items, ruined my evening. Now, I have the luxury to dispose of these food items, but for many families who live from hand to mouth, it's so difficult for them to dispose of the those food items. Hence, they are left with no choice but to eat unwholesome food products. I have also had my experiences with gastroenteritis, which is diarrhea. I remember when I, one of the days after eating in a restaurant, the next day I went to work, and I spent hours in the toilet. That shouldn't be so, because many children, as we all know, die from diarrheal disease every single day. When we, when we hear about global health in the hallowed hallways, press releases of international organizations, donor agencies, ministries of health. We hear things like outbreaks, vaccines, health, universal health coverage, health system strengthening. Also, when we hear about food in Africa, what we hear is malnutrition, hunger, food wastage. Whilst these problems are pertinent, we rarely hear about food safety. Come to think of it, all of us here feed to live. And we also need to realize that nutritious food has to be safe to function. Else, it's going to cause disease in the body, and absorption will be very difficult. Now today, as a food scientist who has worked in international health, what I try to do is to ensure that food is not just available, but is safe. My work also aims to ensure that global policymakers consider food safety as a pertinent global health issue. I do this in my role as the managing principal of a food health systems advisory firm. And what we do is to help companies to set up food quality management systems to ensure foodborne illnesses are reduced to the barest minimum. Also, we support the local food markets, training them to use affordable solutions to ensure food is safe. 
As a lot of us know, electricity is a major issue in Nigeria where I come from. So what I try to do is to ensure that these local food stores are able to handle food in the best possible way and ensure that the people who consume them do not fall sick. So for me, when I'm asked about the finishing lines, I want to see a world where my family, my community, you and I are able to consume food which is a necessity in such a way that it nourishes us and does not make us sick. And this is all my career goal is about. And I'm very sure in a few years we'll meet these lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Okay, we have three more stories left to go. And the next one comes from a pediatrician who works in Angola at the moment, but he's also from Nigeria. And uh, he works for UNICEF there in Angola. Uh, and I know that he used to be a footballer. He played for the national team, Nigeria's national team, the Super Eagles. So uh, please welcome to the stage Super Eagle, Sam Agbo. It was um, March 2003, um, a day to my birthday, and I was out as a health polio officer in UNICEF office in Khartoum. Um, and then walked in my special representative, Cecilia Adona, saying, oh, well, fantastic, we've got a major breakthrough. I wondered what that breakthrough was. And I was looking a little bit baffled, and I said, sir, what is it? He said, well, I read your report, your last report where you stated there were cases of wild polio virus in some refugee camps, and there were many children unvaccinated. And I followed your recommendations to say, well, we should seek for a political agreement between the SLA group and the government of Sudan. And um, we have secured that agreement and we have a week within which to reach out to the Darfur region. I was kind of baffled and confused, and I said, okay. Um, Darfur region had been in crisis six months preceding this time, and they had more than half a million people displaced with refugee camps across the three Darfur uh, states. And uh, I was kind of baffled and confused because preceding this time, we had reports of landmine incidents, we had also cases of uh, staff of Save the Children who were captured. And I was bothered about the security and other concerns. But anyway, to cut the story short, then he said, he further said, well, again, the UN country team had identified and nominated me to lead the mission. Well, I mean, I work for UNICEF. But then, WHO usually, this is WHO's business, not... Uh, a UNICEF's business, and I'm just a desk officer, just writing reports and making plans and strategies and then following up on uh, progress. Uh, well, in my growing days in the barracks, police barracks, all we used to do play hide and seek like every child. And the best I knew of anything about conflict was looking at the mock battles that were carried out by the mobile police people, try to keep peace and all that. Well, I mustered up courage and then went up to the commander of the African Union Peacekeeping Force to solicit for his support for a ground support troop. And then I reached out to the SLA field commander leadership to see if we could agree on coordinates and uh, easy passage to these rebel-held areas. Um, in combination with that, I had to also raise a team of six people, two vehicles, and armed with only a satellite phone. And in those days, we don't have the Google Maps that you see these days, and you can really track things. Um, and then went ahead. Um, in the agreement with the SLA field commanders, we agreed on the hub, and we agreed on the time and, and the, the, the dates and coordinates. I raised uh, um, supplies, health kits, the school in the box kits, and then took sufficient vaccines for about 6,000 children. Our first day in the camp, as usual, and I don't know how many of you have been in conflict zones, but we had to dig our foxholes because we had the ginger weeds and we also have the government uh, antennas that bump 
now and again. And then we, with the theme I set up to clean up a cell center, God is ready, treating patients, and at the same time putting up a tent to get the children back to school. At the end of the day, basically I had to just, okay, well, the kids were still there and there was a ball football in the box. And I took out the football, we set up a small game between the, the, my team and the children. And little did I realize that the soldiers dropped their AK-47 to join us to play. We, in the next four or five days, we were able to reach 5,000 children. At the end of it all, what happened, I found myself moving from a desk help polio officer to a frontline polio soldier. And at the end of the uh, campaign, I left the Darfur region with a beautiful gazelle and uh, a, 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 a belt with amulets and uh, a knife as a token of appreciation. I'd like to round up this presentation and say, a lot of colleagues, volunteers are working in Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. They're reaching out to children across the front line. And I think we must appreciate and recognize their commitment and their drive to making sure that we have a polio-free world. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. If anyone wants to play soccer down the meadow tomorrow, you know who's your guy. I'd put him at goalie, probably. <laughs> Amazing guy. Um, our next speaker is, once again, extraordinary. Stephen Kennedy is a tea addict, as he'll talk about. 12 plus cups of tea a day. He wants everyone to know, so buy him a tea. Um, but he's a lot more serious than that as well. Uh, he is a Liberian scientist. He was literally on the front lines of the Ebola crisis. And he's working with the government to ensure that that kind of crisis doesn't happen again. He's a remarkable individual. I think for me, he's brought to life what I had read about in the news for so long about Liberia and Ebola. And it's our great honor to welcome him to the stage, Stephen Kennedy. My country experienced about 14 years of civil war, and that led to the destruction of the healthcare delivery system. Because of that, numerous Liberian health professionals migrated from the country, including myself. I found myself in, my, in a comfort zone in Kentucky with my kids and family. I worked as an infectious disease epidemiologist and a faculty at the medical school. Three years later, getting ready for work, in the bathroom, I received a phone call from the Minister of Health of my country. There is an importance to this call because he wants me to help return home to help rebuild the healthcare delivery system and also to work on the National AIDS Commission. I returned, I had a discussion with my wife and my children. My wife was not so comfortable, but at least she allowed me to return. I returned to Liberia. Six months later, boom, that's an outbreak of Ebola. Again, the Minister of Health called me and appointed me to serve as the focal person for Ebola in Liberia. It was a difficult challenge. Why? I'm a very shy person. I've avoided leadership in college as well as medical school. At home, my wife is the boss. <laughs> in Liberia, a prototype leader is a huge guy and a detector. And lastly, I've always suffered from a fear of failure. However, because of the law for my country, and the law to help people, I decided to temporarily take on that responsibility. There was a lot of good wills coming in from international organizations as well as friendly countries 
including ZMAP. ZMAP is an investigational drug that was assumed at the time to have some beneficial effect for those who had Ebola. I was in a difficult situation. I had to make a decision. We received six doses of ZMAP. At the time across the country, we had over 300 positive Ebola patients in the emergency treatment unit across the countries. There were women, children, professors, healthcare workers, also friends and colleagues. Being in a position where I have never been making tough decisions, I decided to get out of my comfort zone by putting together a team of 12 Liberians from diverse organizations, including the government, to help me make a decision. I did not know at the time representatives would be calling me, senators would be calling me, people from the office of the president would be calling me. They want those ZMAP to be administered to their friends, relatives, and family member that, that was in the ETU with Ebola. I also have friends and family members that were also in the ETUs. I have never been in such a difficult predicament. The team that I put together to work for the 12 person took two days of deliberation. We could not make, reach a decision, but a decision has to be made and the ZMAP has to be a minister. It was the time I had to step up. I decided at the time that the ZMAP will be a minister to healthcare workers. Maybe because I'm a doctor, maybe because my wife is a nurse, maybe because there's one doctor in Liberia to a population of about 25 to 30,000 persons. That is about a quarter of a doctor for the whole of this, the state of Aspen. We decided at the time that in the ETU, there were three medical doctors, and those three medical doctors will receive three of the same app. The remaining three will go to nurses, and we had to select one nurse from each of the three political subdivisions in the country. Sadly, four survived, two died. Two of the doctors that died were very good friends. We worked together, and one was the country only infectious disease uh, doctor within the country. Today, we are on the verge of celebrating the end of Ebola in Liberia. There is a celebration that is scheduled for the, 20th, the 30th of July, 2016. Today, we realize that 11,000 Liberians were infected with Ebola. Of that amount, 5,000 Liberians died. Did the decision I make at the time in the heat of the moment, during the emergency, did I have an impact that have, might have saved life or might have contributed to the death of more Liberians? This is something every night as I sleep, I suffer from nightmares. This is something that's gonna remain with me for the rest of my life. But I emerged from this epidemic with one key thing, that in my country, I have stepped up and to become a national health leader also, in the West African sub-region, I have stepped up to become a national leader. It is not about me, it is about my country, it is about my people, and I think that I have to make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. A terrible choice to have to make, but I think we can agree that he is now a leader. Thank you, Stephen, very much indeed. We have our last story now. It comes from Ifi Aniebo, and she's a molecular biologist from Nigeria, but she lives in Oxford at the moment because she's studying for a PhD, and uh, she's very keen on shoes, as you will see. 
F. I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and as a young girl, I suffered with so many bouts of malaria infections. The first time I remembered being admitted to the hospital was when I was seven years old. I was given a drug called chloroquine, and I'd suffered adverse reactions to it. It was so uncomfortable, like really, really itchy, and I couldn't sleep. But what I'd observed in the world was that other girls my age, who were also in the same hospital, given the same drug, did not have the same adverse reactions. So I asked the doctor, why am I itching from chloroquine? He said to me, because you've got an adverse reaction. I was like, yeah, I know, but why? <laughs> and he said, don't ask questions. Stop asking questions. And I'm like, so shocked and surprised because I've grown up in a, in a house where my dad allows me to ask whatever questions that I want to ask. I've been so inquisitive, it's so encouraged. And here I am outside my environment, someone saying to me, you can't ask questions. But also in Nigeria, when an elder tells you not to talk, you have to keep quiet. So I was quiet, unhappy, I had to move on with that. The second time I got admitted to the hospital, the drug was changed. I asked the doctor, so, why aren't you giving me the drug you gave me before? Why are you giving me a different one? He said to me, because the other one doesn't work. I said, how do you know it doesn't work? He said, because when people get malaria, come back to the hospital, given this drug, it doesn't clear their infection. I said, why? He said, why are you asking questions? Stop asking questions. You're a girl, you should be worried about the lollipops we give girls after each session. I was furious. Like, why would he say that to me? but I took that in. But the third time that I got admitted to the hospital, this time it was different. Because I got admitted two days after my best friend, Tola. But I got discharged three days after taking a medication, and Tola wasn't. Now Tola and I were two peas in a pod. We're different from other girls. Other girls like playing with Barbie dolls and going for ballet classes. Tola and I loved climbing trees and playing in the mud. Girls loved you know, um, Disney cartoons, and we were comic book geeks. Our favorite being the X-Men. And if you don't know who the X-Men are, they're a bunch of humans who get mutations and then become superhumans. And they get cool abilities like being, um, being um, shapeshifters or controlling the weather or being telepathic. Now, unfortunately, Tola laid there sick. I and my mom went to visit her and went to give her gifts, chocolates, just to say, see how she was doing. But she was unresponsive. So we had to leave for a bit just to make sure that her parents could spend time with her. And then, moments later, whilst I and my mom were waiting in the corridor, I heard Tala's mom screaming, shouting Tala's name, but she was unresponsive. Tala was lying there, she had convulsed, unresponsive, she had died. I rushed into the room looking at her. My best friend was dead. And I didn't understand why she was dead. As a, as a seven-year-old, obviously that's like the most shocking thing. No one has given me answers. I'm this kid who everyone keeps ignoring. Weeks later, I walk into my dad's study. I'm a daddy's girl. My dad answers all my questions. But unfortunately, my dad was a chemical engineer who could answer my question. So he called his best friend, who's a medical doctor, and he answered my question perfectly. He said to me, when you give malaria parasites drugs for a very long time, they become resistant, i.e. immune to it, because they get a mutation that gives them super abilities, that allows them to evade the immune system. I was like, oh, hold on, is that kind of like the X-Men then? He goes, yes, exactly, like the X-Men. And for me, in that moment, it was so clear to me that I knew why my friend had died, and I knew why all the drugs that I keep getting, they keep giving me kept on changing. But that was the defining moment in my career. I've since gone on to be a scientist. I've focused in malaria drug resistance. And at the moment, I'm proud to say that I've created a novel, innovative, lab-based process that can make us identify malaria parasites when they become resistant, track them down, and control them. Now, this is very important because at the moment, malaria kills children in Africa under the ages of five 
and also pregnant women. It's also very important because the last drug we're using is becoming resistant. And if this spreads to Africa, it's going to be devastating. Now, it's been a curious journey. It's been exhilarating, it's been exciting, it's been one driven by curiosity, you know, and the curiosity drives my passion and I'm there all the time. I've given my work blood, sweat and tears, literally. Blood, because sometimes my parasites wouldn't want to grow, I'd give them my own blood and they're happy with it. Sweat, because I stay in the lab sometimes for three days without being knowing what's going on out there, literally living in the rock, and tears because I've cried enough times in my experiments not work out. But it's been exciting. But I'll leave you with this. What I've gathered from this is this. It's not okay for girls to be shut down. It's okay for you to answer the questions. It's okay for them to be inquisitive, because you never know. They might be the next global health leader who could find a cure for malaria. Thank you. <laughs> Ify, thank you so much. You are extraordinary. We're going to wrap this up right now. I want to first bring everyone back up onto the stage, all the speakers back up on the stage. Well, while we're doing that, while you're standing up and applauding, we need to first thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and our opening speaker. I would love to thank my special co-host, Anna, it was extraordinary to work with you. Thank you so much for your great work. This entire fellowship program is made possible by the Aspen Institute Global Health and Development. It has two very shy, very capable staff members who just waved me off and said they're not coming up on stage. But since I've already fulfilled this contract, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome them to come up on stage. I won't give them the microphone. Please welcome to the stage, Andrew, and if Rachel's here. They are the best of the best. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Huge round of applause for our speakers. Enjoy the rest of your night.